data while I was a student in planning school. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I, my title is sounds fancy um, and is totally made up, but we can talk about it. <laughs> um, but what it really means is a lot of my work is at the intersection of the technology that we're developing at OTI and at the field work that we do, which is where we do a lot of community-based research. So the Red Hook Wi-Fi project, it, which I'm going to talk about today, is actually one of those projects. Um, it's specifically, we are testing our uh, mesh wireless firmware for routers, which is open source, um, in a community, as well as curriculum around how to build uh, community wireless networks. So um, most of our practices, and this is sort of, again, something that we, um, this, is, uh, this project for us is us testing this practice, uh, is around the idea that creating digital networks is actually mostly a social collaborative process. So um, these are some images from workshops in Detroit about thinking about planning where to put routers, how they want to make this work in their community. Um, so I work specifically with the Red Hook Initiative, which is based in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Is that, who here is familiar with Red Hook? Okay, we got about a third. So um, Red Hook uh, <laughs> is a, it, historically an industrial community. Uh, it's where a lot of the um, cruise ships actually still come in. It's where there's a lot of shipping and industry. And it's separated by, um, from the rest of Brooklyn by a highway, which is what you can see in that picture. It also has one of the largest conglomerations of public housing in New York. So of the 15,000 people that live in Red Hook, about 11,000 live in the public housing. So that's, uh, this is an aerial view from the south of it, from on top of what's called the fairway building. Uh, so what you can see in this is that tall building is one of the big areas of public housing and everything to the side of it that's sort of a similar brick color. So. Um, one of the key aspects of the project in Red Hook is to work through trusted community organizations uh, to build a solid relationship with technical support um, inside and outside of the community, uh, to do this through community-led process, that's a civic engagement process, and to start thinking about how to prototype local applications, so apps that are neighborhood-specific and potentially don't even need the internet. Uh, the technology we're using um, where the hardware itself, we use um, Ubiquiti routers, uh, so probably lots of people are familiar with their Linksys or Netgear routers at home. Ubiquiti is great for outdoor equipment, and one of the really cool things is they're totally pro open source software. So we can buy their hardware, and then we can put whatever we want on it. So the platform that we're actually developing at the Open Technology Institute is called Commotion Wireless, and it's an ad hoc network platform uh, based off of OpenWRT for anyone who's like into networking um, <laughs> and uses the OLSRD routing protocol. Um, I am not one of our developers, so if you have a lot of questions about that, I can give you email addresses um, and I can answer really high level questions. <laughs> My background's in urban planning and UX, not <laughs> in development. Um, so one of the reasons that we like to work with mesh and ad hoc routing platforms is that they're self-healing and distributed. So they can actually mirror, we can build networks that mirror our social relationships. So we don't ha instead have to rely on a hub and spoke model. Instead, we can build an organic network that's modeled after how the community actually works. So um, in Red Hook, this started as an experiment, uh, so experimental that, that I believe is painter's tape attaching a router to a pole on a rooftop. <laughs> and um, this is, we work, our main community partner is the Red Hook Initiative, and they sort of, their building is um, catty corner to basically the center of the public housing. So that's all NYCHA property in front of them. Uh, and the idea at first was just like, let's set up a wireless access point here. Uh, so here we had internet access so people could use their devices, um, anything that was Wi-Fi enabled, they could hop on on their cell phones if they have smartphones that have Wi-Fi and use the network there instead of using their data plans. Um, there was another router that was sitting on top of a building just a couple blocks away, but not within sight of that one. And so this one actually didn't have an internet gateway and was just running a little web server off of a Guru Plug box. Has anybody heard of those before? They're like literally this big and it's basically a web server. Anyway, so you, um, it's a little tiny piece of hardware that we could just run basically a web page sitting there and so when people got to it they could leave messages for each other. Uh, so they, most of them were about how this was broken because people were expecting there to be internet access when they jumped on a Wi-Fi hotspot <laughs> um, and leaving messages to each other like, hey, this is broken. Yeah, it's broken for me too. 
what's going on? Why is this here? Who's this? <laughs> um, people started talking to each other, which was interesting. And so this was right near one of the big public spaces in the neighborhood. Uh, and from there, the idea was to start thinking about how you might use the network. So we held community brainstorming sessions. This is um, two of my colleagues, Jonathan, who at the time was a grad student and is now doing mobile research, um, figuring out what he's going to do next. And Tony Schloss is the coordinator from the Red Hook Initiative. He's sitting down there. So they met with um, community members from the community change workers. They met with some of the young adult radio groups, young media, the youth media groups and just started brainstorming ideas of what you might do with a wireless network. And in doing that, they sort of started highlighting issues in the community. So um, they started noticing that, they started talking about the fact that communication was really difficult. Nobody ever knew what was going on or where it was happening. Uh, they never knew when the bus was coming, because when it did, there's only one bus route that even comes through the neighborhood. And so when it did show up, usually late, it was already full and you couldn't even get on, and then you'd have to, maybe there'd be one right after, maybe there wouldn't. Um, so there were all these sort of problems that technology could maybe help with. So uh, one of the things that we started prototyping out was a um, community mapping platform. And so that's what you actually see them testing in this photo here. Uh, and it wasn't just that it's actually all based on Leaflet. Um, it's all open source mapping tools <laughs> and MongoDB. And uh, it wasn't just that they were using it to map things in their neighborhood. They actually designed the tiles themselves as well. So everything about the application was really community-based. Like, they decided how they wanted to represent their community. So even though most of the environment itself is, you know, some sort of industrial-looking concrete buildings, they were able to make it green if they wanted it to be green or really represent, like, neighborhood character in an icon for a place. Uh, so a lot of that came through, like, collaborative sketching sessions and then Jonathan helping to turn it into um, a, a web tool. So they also, um, the, to address the bus issue, luckily the first bus line that was being tested for uh, bus time, which is a project of Open Plans and Aaron worked on, I think, <laughs> um, was the bus that goes through their neighborhood. So we, uh, Jonathan prototyped out using the API to pull in the bus schedules when they were coming, when the next one was coming, and, and tailored it just for that line and just for the neighborhood. And again, using the um, iconography of the neighborhood. One of the crazy things about this the entire Brooklyn high-res SVG map of the buses is actually in this bus stop. <laughs> um, so if you zoom all the way in, he embedded it in there, and I, I still don't really know why, but it's kind of a cool fact. <laughs> you can do that with SVGs. Um, so all this sounds fun and, explore and experimental, uh, and then Superstorm Standy happened. <laughs> so um, the Reddick Initiative was in one of the areas in the neighborhood that actually didn't lose power. Uh, and so people flocked there for all sorts of resources, but also just because they knew there was Wi-Fi there that they could get on and tell people, tell families that, uh, not in New York that they were okay. Uh, the Red Hook Initiative also started using the, the Wi-Fi network to put out messages about where there would be hot food, um, where you could go and fill out your forms for, get, for getting assistance from FEMA, uh, where there would be you know, blankets and sweaters because we didn't get power or heat back for three weeks in Red Hook. <laughs> so, and it did snow the following week, which was awesome. Um, so one of the other things that we quickly added in was the ability to text to Tidepool, so to the mapping application. And uh, in doing that, people could say like, oh, we need a generator here. And some of the responders who were at the Red Hook Initiative could actually reply from the map and it would send a text back to the person. So you could have a from uh, from the computer to the person without moderation built in on the platform that they were already familiar with. Um, and because we were using Mesh, uh, and as I was talking about earlier, it's self-healing, we were able to put up a couple more routers and take the internet signal that was at the Red Hook Initiative and wrap it around to the main park where they were doing recovery coordination. So where the first, where the Red Cross was located, where the tents were for giving out food. Um, Bloomberg quickly asked all of the food trucks to just start go and giving people food in all the neighborhoods that didn't have food access. So there were regularly food trucks around this park. Um, and in a couple places, actually, the one at the church in the bottom photo, we were running that off of a battery, a 12-hour battery that we would recharge and keep it going so that the Wi-Fi could cover the park. Um, so the map that goes with this. <laughs> Uh, so the Reddick Initiative is over here. We had a router there and a router there, and we were able to put one up in the middle to wrap it around. Um, so uh, that's just a picture of the network. 
so where does that put us now? So that was all last year. So as a result of this, we actually got funding to do more um, basically workforce development training within Red Hook. And so we started a program that we call Digital Stewards. So this gets at the curriculum that I was talking about. So these uh, five young adults and Tony, who I was pointing out before, have been working with um, us since January. And they've been learning about how to build networks, how to, uh, they know how to make their own ethernet cables. Um, they've been working a lot around how to plan in their neighborhoods. So this is an exercise we do called Every Network Tells a Story, where they have um, routers and they learn about how strong they are and they start um, sort of social mapping their neighborhood as well as physically mapping to figure out where you might put certain routers. So you might want to leverage the fact that the library has internet uh, and put a higher powered router there as like a public shared space, right? Or um, a lot of people live, uh, so one of the, this one in particular shows two main corridors that they were trying to highlight where they're not sure how they could work or cross those boundaries. So um, a lot of sort of social, social geographic mapping <laughs> in that <laughs> exercise. Um, we started doing some site surveys. So again, we went back and reused that texting tool. And the young adults went out and said, oh, here's a flat roof that we could potentially put a mount on. Or um, this, is, you know, this is a really great business that we might want to work with. Uh, and so they went and were able to text message the addresses of all those places and add it to the map really easily. Um, they started figuring out how to message to their neighborhoods <laughs> about what they were doing, <laughs> how to talk about this to the rest of their neighbors. So these are some <coughs> prototype flyers. Um, and they went around and did a more complete inventory of all the potential partners. So businesses in their neighborhood, nonprofits they might want to partner with, where the schools are. So doing a lot of asset mapping of the actual neighborhood, thinking about who were good partners and how to, how to leverage those relationships to start building this network out more. Um, we also, with help from us, we started looking at the Form 477 data. So who in this room knew that the FCC provides open data? I'm not going to say that it's great open data. OK, cool, <laughs> a couple. I'm not going to say that it's awesome, but um, it's helpful. <laughs> uh, so this is actually the Form 77 data, uh, which tells you how many households are subscribing to broadband um, within a census tract. So. Uh, to make this look a little bit, <laughs> make it makes more sense, um, I joined it with residential and uh, mixed use buildings uh, in Brooklyn. So you can see, um, for everyone who is familiar with 1970s era public housing footprints, um, <laughs> the public housing is very low uh, household adoption rates for broadband, um, which isn't that surprising. They actually do have two choices in the housing as a result of some of the investments through the Broadband Technical Opportunities Program. Um, but it's too expensive for most of the people that live there. And so what we did, we ended up doing um, a neighborhood survey and finding that although people could have access or maybe have it at home, they might not have a computer, right? Maybe it's only hooked up to the Xbox, which they prioritized over getting a computer, right? Because there's kids in the family, and that's what they wanted. And that seemed like the resource to get, which is all a choice that they're allowed to make. But um, so the need for the Wi-Fi is sort of clear in the sense that people tend to buy the smartphone or the game device rather than getting a computer at home. So even if they have the access, they have it limited by their mobile data plans or don't have data plans at all. Um, so these are some photos of the young adults starting to do installations on rooftops, um, sometimes somewhat dangerously hanging out over the side of a roof. But he was very safe, I promise. Uh, <laughs> they started learning about how to do um, really sort of complicated network setups. Uh, and these are people who have no technology training prior to this. Some of them have, at most, like one semester of college. Um, this is uh, Kathy is building an Ethernet cable. She's putting the, uh, opening the end of it to put a cap on, on the end of it. This is a router hanging out on someone's rooftop garden. <laughs> Um, and now, actually, the network has expanded a lot. So we still have sort of the areas that you saw before. Um, we don't have one of the routers that uh, was on the top of an auto body shop because after the hurricane, he was sort of no longer interested in being involved. So he's not a great community partner. Um, but the only spot that's missing is actually, or two spots, they just didn't install at the library last week, which actually adds a lot more coverage in here. And um, they have a new office spot over there and have a whole other area of coverage by the waterfront. So and that's a map of the network. Um, we've also done some uh, expansions and improvements on the local application. So this is sort of a new version of Tidepools. Uh, 
just built all on so it's Leaflet, Mongo, Express, and Angular. Um, and I, it's, they've done, now that they've been doing all that asset mapping of the businesses in the neighborhood, they've gone around and also built some of them like little local commercial videos and they're embedding that in the map and having it as sort of a big local platform. The idea is to potentially do job postings so that people can, um, businesses can show jobs that are available and residents who need them can apply to them and we can do that on a local scale rather than leaving the neighborhood because um, it's relatively hard to do that. Uh, so the big lessons out of this is that the social relationships are really the most important um, and that the, doing this as a community driven process uh, is really rewarding in a number of levels. Um, some of the young adults now actually intern with a local internet service provider who's our partner on the project. So they're doing uh, learning about wiring installations. They're also starting to think about what other data we could be collecting on the network. So could we be putting sensors in wherever we're putting a router in uh, and doing some more environmental data collection? Um, we've been thinking a lot about alternative power. So now that we have this network in place, if the hurricane comes again, we have, we're set in some places, but we still probably need a generator or solar powered router in a couple places, um, which will at least allow us to have that local communication uh, and local tools, local everything <laughs> um, in place and ready to go when it, if it happens again. Uh, so yeah, sensors and more apps. Um, they're having their first community meeting tonight. I'm actually missing because I'm here with you guys, uh, where they're going to engage the community around like, what do we think we need now? So now that we have these tools in place, what's the next step? What other apps do we think we need? So this job one is probably the biggest one that's going to come up, but um, there may be more. Who knows? I'll find out more tomorrow when I get back. Um, and that's it. So, thanks. <laughs>